What's up, Michael Groff here, and in this video, I'm going to show you the top five mistakes that we've seen startups make in Webflow and how you can avoid them altogether. If you want to grab our PDF report called Webflow Mistakes 101, where we go over these five mistakes and how to fix them with visuals and things like that, like you can send it to your developer or whatever, you can grab that in the description below. But without any further ado, let's get right into it. So the first mistake is not understanding how classes work and how to use them correctly. So in Webflow, Webflow is built entirely around classes. Classes are a huge thing of Webflow, and there are three different kinds of classes. You have primary classes, second, you have primary classes, combo classes, and then global classes. So right now I'm gonna click on this text element, and if you go over in the style panel, you can see in the selector, we have this blue box, and it says text inside of it. That is the class for this element. You can name this anything you want. I just quickly typed in text. From here, if we were to drop in, in another heading element or another text element, and then go up into the selector and start typing in text, you can see we already have an existing class called text. If I were to select that, you see it automatically applied the styling that we have to this element. The styling here is very minimal. The only style we have applied is it's aligning the text to the center. Since these elements are now connected with the same class, any style change we make to one element will affect the second element. So if I left align the text, it's going to affect, it's going to affect both elements. If I center it again, it's going to affect both elements. The thing people get confused with this is they'll download a Webflow template or something and they'll start copying sections from one page to another page and they're making design changes and then all of a sudden they find out it's changing the design for a lot of different sections all over their site it's because they're all connected with the same classes that brings us into combo classes if you would like to make a specific style to one element and not all the other elements connected with that same class you would click up in the selector and add a combo class it's just like adding a primary class you can name anything you want so i'm going to name this color blue because I'm going to make the text blue from here I can go down to the colors and I can change the color of this text now that this combo class is applied any styles we make to this element won't affect this element even though they are connected with the primary classes however if I were to change styles for the primary element where there is no combo class applied so let's say I would make it all caps it would still affect the class or the element with this combo class because they are still connected with the primary class. Now that is primary classes and combo classes. The third class is a global class. So for example, I'm going to drop in another text element here and then I'm going to give it the, um, I'm going to give it a class of, let's see, underline. And then I'm going to give it a style of underline and then right now we have a global class. So what we can do is if I drop in another heading element and I give it a class underline, it's going to automatically add an underline. We already know that's how that works. That's how primary classes work. The benefit of global classes is we can add this global class underline to any text element, no matter if it already has a class applied, if it already has combo classes, it doesn't matter. And it is automatically going to add an underline. So. Let's go to this heading element right here. We have a primary class text. We have a combo class color blue. And then let's say we want to add an underline. So we'll just click in, we'll start typing underline and you can see it's starting to suggest the underline class. But notice it's under global combo classes. That means it is a global class. If I click on it, it's going to add the underline. The reason this is helpful is say for example, we are using a lot, this is a bad example, but say we are using a lot of underlines on all kinds of areas of text on our website. Say you go through a rebrand, you want to remove all those underlines, you can just click on the global class, which would most likely sit in your style guide. We can go down to the single style that it has applied, the, the underline, and we can just remove it. It will remove it from all elements that use that global class. So global classes are very, very powerful. The style guide that we use for every new project we built comes included with a ton of global classes. 
And using these global classes, we can manipulate the design of the website directly from the style guide. Okay, so the second mistake a lot of startups make in Webflow is not using padding and margin in the correct places and not understanding how padding and margin works. So for example, I'm gonna use this section as a great example. The difference between padding and margin is margin adds spacing outside of the element and margin adds spacing inside of the element. So if I were to click on the section and then add vertical padding, you can see it nicely adds padding on top and bottom of the text element. And we nicely have the background color that is currently applied to the section. However, if I were to remove this vertical padding and then I were to add vertical margin, you can see we are still getting space above the uh, on top and bottom of the text element, but the space is being pushed outside of the section element. You can tell that because the background color isn't expanding. We are only adding space outside of the section element. And one area specifically that I see people really um, having trouble with padding and margin is one, not being organized on where they use padding and margin. For example, when you're putting padding between your sections, Try to stay consistent. Are you going to put the padding on the section? Are you going to put the padding on the container? So that, say you want to decrease the padding between all your sections on your website, you know exactly what elements are going to have which styles applied to it. Okay, and the third mistake I see startups making is they don't use a style guide. So right now we are in a project that we give away for free. It's a free template that we have. It's just a one pager. And if you go to the pages panel, by the way, you can clone this. I will put a link in the description. We have a style guide. If I were to click on that, we have a pretty robust style guide that goes over classes, um, different text styles and things like that. You don't have to build this from scratch. You can clone these style guides anywhere you want. But basically using this style guide, we can manipulate the design of our entire site right from this page. Also, say down the road, we go through a rebrand, our colors change, font changes, all that stuff. We can just go through the style guide, update everything globally, and we don't have to go through all the hard work of going through page by page and making those changes, which if you're doing that, isn't efficient at all. So for example, for this website, I'm going to change the font. All I would have to do is click on the body element go to selector and select all body or all body, the body for all pages. And then I were to change the font. So let's just change it to anything we want. Uh, let's do Meriwether. Now, if we go back to the homepage, you can see that it changed the font across the entire site. So with one change, we completely changed the look and feel of our website with one simple change. Okay, so that's the benefit of using a style guide and so far, if you are have any questions about any of this or you are struggling with something specific for your website, we offer Webflow Consulting. There'll be links in the description where you can schedule a call with myself and I'll hop on the call, answer your questions live, even share my screen, show you how to fix things that you're having trouble with. But the fourth thing startups tend to get frustrated with is not understanding how breakpoints work. So I'm back in this basic project and you can see up near the top, we have these little icons of different screen sizes. We have the default breakpoint and then we have tablet mobile landscape mobile portrait and then on the other side we have a larger screen size that is 1920 pixels wide and up basically with breakpoints we can change the styling of elements for that breakpoint specifically now one thing about breakpoints is if you make a style change on the default breakpoint the breakpoint with the little star the styles will affect tablet mobile landscape mobile portrait and they'll also affect larger screen size like this 1920 pixels and up. However, if we were to go to tablet and we were to change the style of this text, so we'll just make the text color red, this style will only apply to tablet, mobile landscape, and mobile portrait. If we go back up to the default breakpoint or even the large screen breakpoint, it did not make that style change. That's because in CSS, styles cascade down. So if I were to make a design change on the default breakpoint, it would go both ways. It would cascade down and cascade up. If I were to make the style change for iPad, it would only cascade down. Same thing if I were to go to mobile landscape, change the color to a purple, it will cascade down to mobile portrait, but it won't cascade up to mobile 
I mean to tablet. Same thing for the large screen sizes. If I were to change the color for the text and make it like a green, it will only affect this screen size and larger. If I were to go down to the default breakpoint, it would not affect that screen size at all. Okay, so I took away all the color styles for all the breakpoints. We're just back to the standard gray color. And there is a way that you can figure out where the style is coming from for a specific element. So if we stay on default breakpoint, so if we click on the text element and go down here, you can see it's highlighted in a blue color. That means the style is being applied on this breakpoint. If I were to go to iPad, you can see that this color changes from blue to orange. If we were to click on the orange, you can see value comes from and it shows the breakpoint with the star. So that's how you can quickly determine where the styles are coming from. Same thing applies with global, I mean, combo classes. So if I were to add a combo class on here, so italic and then make it italics, you can see the color is no longer blue, it is orange. That means if we click on it, you can see it comes from the text class on the default breakpoint. Okay, and the last thing we see startups getting very frustrated with is not understanding how CNAME flattening works. When you add a custom domain to your Webflow project, you're gonna have these two options. You're gonna have the non www dot version and then you're going to have the www dot version and if i hover over one or the other you can see you can make one or the other the, the default which means if you make the non www dot version the default if someone goes into the browser and types in www dot your website dot com it's going to redirect them to your website.com without the www. Why that happens has to do with SEO and things like that and that I'm not going to explain in this video, but a lot of startups and tech companies specifically like to make the non www. version the default because they think it looks cooler, which it does technically look cooler. However, it will 100% depend on where their domain is registered. For example, this domain fittermedia.com is registered with Namecheap and Namecheap doesn't support CNAME flattening. So I can only use the domain with the www. If I were to make the domain with the, without the www, the default, you'd start seeing redirect issues and errors when trying to go to the website. So if this has been causing you trouble where you've been getting redirect errors, all you have to do is search wherever your uh, domain is registered, just search does your domain registrar, so if you use Namecheap, does Namecheap support CNAME flattening? Namecheap doesn't, I know GoDaddy doesn't because a lot of our clients use GoDaddy, but Cloudflare is one of few that do support CNAME flattening. So if your domain is registered there, you will be able to use the non www dot version. Okay, so that is the five mistakes we see startups get frustrated with all the time. And if you are looking for Webflow development, that is something we offer. We're professionals at transferring designs from Figma into Webflow. Uh, everything is optimized for accessibility, SEO, all that good stuff. If that interests you, there are links in the description where you can get started.